Hello. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm happy to provide your diversity for the evening. <laughs> Well, and thank all of you for being here tonight. It's such a like, such a treat to to have yeah. this event. Thanks for Everson. coming. Yeah. This is cool. Yay! So, how would you describe Meaty? Like, what if you had to? <laughs> uh, um, well, it's funny because I wrote it like five years ago, right? And I, when we redid it to reissue it. Uh, I was reading it and was like, who is this person? <laughs> um, but it is a collection of, I feel like the word essays makes them like feel, you know, like smarter than they are. <laughs> like academic. Um, yeah, like feel like, like essays. <laughs> um, blog posts in, a, in book form. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a collection of essays that are about a whole host of things. Um, all of them about me, so if you don't like me, you won't like it. But uh, it's about like my terrible early dating life and about Crohn's disease, which is awful, but I managed to like squeeze some laughs out of it, no pun intended. <laughs> on you, my fellow IBD sufferers. You wear it with grace, though. You really do. <laughs> like, you, you make a lot of room for people's experience when you Thank talk you. about that stuff. Thank you. So, yeah, it's just, I mean, they, my first publisher said you can do whatever you want and we'll publish nice. it. And when you read it, you'll see that it's, <laughs> they let me do whatever I want and put it in a book, and somehow people liked it. <laughs> you guys need this book. Um, if you don't laugh out loud while you're reading it, you probably need to get some help from a <laughs> professional, oh. just as a heads up, because it's really, it's, it's real. I mean, and that's the thing about that's authentic That's hard to live up to. Like, somebody's going to hate read it and be like, no, oh, not funny. Oh, you come for me then. Yeah. You come for me. You leave her alone. They're going to be like, no, mm -mm, I didn't laugh out loud. The problem's not me. <laughs> Let's hope. We can have that conversation post back, though. Um, with the book having so much really vulnerable detail mm -hmm. about your, especially your experience with IBD, mm -hmm. um, with Crohn's disease, and having to use the bathroom <laughs> urgently <laughs> in a number of interesting settings, uh -huh. um, you know, that's so vulnerable. Like, how does it feel for you meeting your public when you know they know all about your bathroom habits? Well. <laughs> It wasn't weird until right now. Oh, good. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I feel like if, if you've uh, pooped in a bag on the side of the highway, there really is no such thing as shame after <laughs> that. And honestly, it is, uh, it's freeing. Awesome. I think. <laughs> like, okay, because listen, like if I needed to leave, leave right now and take a break, I wouldn't have to like fake a phone call. No. I'd be like, you guys know what's about to happen. <laughs> I'm gonna be gone for nine or to 17 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, for the nine yeah, side, yeah. for your sake. I'm, I'm going to be gone for a while, and I don't have to pretend like I wasn't just pooping when I come back. Um, I think like one of the things that I didn't anticipate but has definitely like made me continue to write about it is people have reached out to me. I started raising money for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, Aww. and like people have. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for clapping for my. Butthole. So, um, I don't know if I can say that, but you can say that. I said it. Um, and like people started donating to that, mm -hmm. and people would come to my readings and, you know, and like take me aside and be like, you know, I have that problem too. Thank you for writing about it. And like when people, when it seems like it's doing, my goal ultimately is to do a little bit of good and like. <laughs> you know, make people laugh. I'd like to be useful in some way to people. Mm -hmm. And if like reading about that makes someone else feel less alone or less, I don't know, like I'm not enough of a 
student to like know uh, how to say this properly. But I feel like socially, like poop is such a weird thing, but we all do it. Like no one gives you a hard time for breathing. Right. I mean, it's basically the same right. thing. Or sweating. I mean, I mean sweating's sw kind of equally gross in yeah, some ways, right? Yeah, and people have no problem being like, I sweat, but like, you know, if you have to go to the bathroom, it's like, oh, please, excuse me, I'm sorry for this mess my body's making. Um, <laughs> but like, if I help people feel less, you know, scared to talk about it, yeah. it just makes life a little bit easier. Well, you're kind of saving lives then. <laughs> well. Basically, you're a life saver. Yes, actually, yes. Well, Where is my honorary Nobel Prize or whatever? Coming. Yeah. Any minute. Is there a poop equivalent? We're I hoping. will. I we'll will start take one. it. <laughs> yeah, right. We're going to take donations tonight for the poop equivalent yeah. of the Nobel Prize. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Well, I think too, you know, when people have an experience and they don't really know that it's a thing and they read about your experience, they're like, oh my God, that's, that's a thing? That's a disease? Mm -hmm. I could like maybe talk to my doctor about that. So that's yeah. huge. Yeah. I mean, I feel like now there are like commercials. <laughs> for medications on TV. So I feel like we've really made some poop advances. Making a bigger wave. Yeah, well, a bigger splash, I like to, I like to say. Um, so I feel like it's becoming more and more, you know, I mean, the stigma is lessening. So yeah. if I can even have a tiny part in that, then <laughs> all I can think of is like bad Poop I know it's so. I'm really I like. I want to hear them though. No, I think no, these no. Want to I don't want them. anyone to no? uh, okay. be disgusted. But I feel like if, like, if we're removing the stigma from it, then maybe, I mean, you know, maybe younger people will have. Because you know, Crohn's like strikes early, and kids don't know how to talk about it, and sure. like suffering and silent agony. It's also the kind of thing that's really easy for people to write off. Like when I was a kid, everyone was like, oh, you just ate the wrong thing. Right. Or, you know, you need to, don't eat Oreos. And I was like, well, this is, now I know to say, sure. this is autoimmune, okay? Right, I get uh, Oreos. Like, <laughs> but, screw you, give me my Oreo. <laughs> yeah, but it's an easy thing to just like laugh off or to not tell someone. So if me constantly blabbering, if my constant blabbering <laughs> about it helps other people go like, maybe I have a problem, then it will have been well, and the it. shame part, too. You yeah. know, you can't underestimate the power of shame in people's lives. Mm -hmm. and it really is a silencer. I so. mean, shame is a big motivator for me in other ways, <laughs> but not in the talking about what my way, bathroom what habits. What ways does shame motivate you? Um, I, like, my social interactions. Okay. Like, I am always embarrassed all the time that I'm doing the wrong thing or going the wrong place or in someone's way. So shame is a big, like, don't do that. Don't. don't say that. <laughs> like, so I've got an active editor working at all times. Yes, unless someone like asks me what I just did in the toilet, and then it all goes out of the window. <laughs> so the shame is for the rest of life, not yes. the toilet. Yes. I like that. Yeah. Or the bedroom. Yeah. Well, yeah. which is also liberating. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. rad. Yeah, I would. You know, I wouldn't like tell you what I think about things, but you know, if you're like, what do you think about that movie? I'd be like, oh. Don't say that. Your opinion is going to be dumb. But if you were like, hey, did you have sex with that guy? I'd be like, yes and how. And then, you know, <laughs> very specific areas of freedom. <laughs> I like it. So you're, you know, obviously a very funny person. Have you ever thought about doing stand-up? Stand-up is the devil. Um, <laughs> I would, now first, first of all, stand-up comedians are the worst people you could ever <laughs> meet. Do you know, like you know, a fun, you know I know a lot of, of stand-up comedians and they're all horrible. It also Good doesn't pay. I mean, like Chris Rock and Dave Spell make money, but like Joe stand-up is, is getting paid in drink tickets and like, I'm too old to be <laughs> willfully broke. Like. If I just happen to be poor, that's one thing, but I can't like shoes. sleep on a couch. I'm 38 years old. I wear orthopedic shoes. I'm not <laughs> like sleeping on a couch and no. like, no, I can't, no. I can't live like that. I support that. But also like the, so the audience for this kind of thing, like people generally are like excited to see you and like not hostile. And comedy audiences like right. walk in the door like with their arms crossed, like impress me. And if you don't, they shout things 
up at you. I, that never. wouldn't go well. No, I would die on stage. I would like melt like a candle and Aww. then they'd have to scrape me off and throw me in an urn or whatever. It would be terrible. All right, well, no one's going to make you do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. but. No, no, I never would. So do you Also, have... like, touring, I hate being on the road. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you like your no house, things. right? I do. You probably have a nice bed with good linens. Yeah, I do. From what I've read, you have a, you have a good taste for, like, home <laughs> products. Yes. I do like a fancy candle, yeah. so that's not the life of a touring comic, I'm telling you. <laughs> They're not like lighting Joe Malone candles at night. They are not. They're like eating cat food. Uh, <laughs> and drinking uh, and scotch. Drink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sleeping in the back seat of their car. No thanks. No. Mm -mm. That's, so what, other, what are some of the other things about touring that you're kind of like, I could maybe live without? Well, I, so I have not traveled a lot. So I'm on tour now. I've been away from home for like six weeks, oh which my is... Gosh. Long time. Well, everybody gasped. That's I'm, a lot. I don't, I'm glad that you feel very six. sorry for me we sleeping do. in free hotels. <laughs> 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 but like, I don't know a lot about like traveling. And like, when I was in DC, I so like the publisher pays for your hotel, and you just go and check in. But something was wrong with the card, and because. I am filled with shame. I immediately felt like it was my fault. Oh, no. And they asked me for a card and. I You're mean, like, I uh, gave him one, but... <laughs> it was a gamble. Yeah, I don't really have, like, Traverse City credit. I have, like, <laughs> Flint credit. That's a terrible thing to say. That's a horrible thing to say. You, if you laughed at that, you're racist. It's not on me. True. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. So I give them, like, my one Amex that I got in the airport because... <laughs> You know how like you have you a get long a layover. Flight, right? Yeah, you, you have a long layover, and the lady asks you like six times when you walk by her going to the bathroom, like, "Hey, want to apply? Want to apply?" So like they gave me a card with like a thousand dollar limit or something, and so I give it to this hotel clerk or like desk person, and I was like, "This is not gonna go through," and it did. But then my phone blew up because Amex was like, "Uh, you don't do this. <laughs> yeah, who's who do you think you are? We gave you that for show." Um, <laughs> We just, we just wanted you to have it in your wallet so your friends could see it when you're like <laughs> pretending you're going to pay the check. <laughs> so, <laughs> little, like, it's all the stuff like that. Like, I didn't know how to get my laundry done <laughs> in a hotel, and figuring that out is awful as you're like handing some poor hotel worker like your soiled clothes and being like, light starch on the bloomers or whatever. So, <laughs> it has been it's just. Did you say that? I, no. I kind of want, I want to be in that world. No, I, I, I turned purple and like shoved it out the door and was like, bring it back whenever, even <laughs> though I really needed it the next day because I'm just so horrified by everything. So I would like to be at home. Uh, where your stuff is, right? Yes. You know how to yeah. work the remote. Yeah, I don't have to like, you know, I always wonder, like, I know people don't pay attention to anything you ever do, but it doesn't stop the voice in my head from thinking like they have watched me like let in three delivery people, you know? <laughs> They're tracking yes. how much They're like, mm, a pizza, <laughs> hot dogs, you know what I mean? I'm like, they don't care, but like that's all the stuff that drives me nuts. But you know nuts, they so. know. Yes, they do know. It's their job to like watch what you do and do like, you like send people to your room. It's excruciating. <laughs> do you feel like you're kind of being surveilled all the time when you're on the road? Yeah. Well, if it's not the staff, there's also like a, this is the difference be between having like a book on a little press with mm -hmm. no money and having like Random House be your, be your publisher. Like there's like a team of people in New York who like know everything I do <laughs> when I'm on the road and like look at all the bills. <laughs> What did you need 14 limes for, Samantha? Right. Like that kind of thing? Yes, yeah. Like how did you kill every tequila bottle in that <laughs> minibar? So I it just feel like I'm under a microscope and like th that part of touring, I'm like, I'm ready to be. Do you feel like you're it. being watched at home ever? Of course, because I live with other people now. Okay. <laughs> and I never had to before. And there's always someone who's like, what's that? <laughs> what are you watching? What are you listening to? 
What's what that eating? food you hid behind that other food that you didn't want us to see? It's, I mean, it's torture. Yeah. So, I, I was just thinking that I wanted to get like an office, but like, you know, like some people like get an office like to have an affair or whatever, but I would get an office to like sit with my headphones on without anyone being like, need anything? And I'm like, ah, just pretend that I don't exist. <laughs> would you hide food at your office? Yes, yeah. I was just, you know. Yeah, I, it's mostly because I don't like, so I have a wife now who's like a healthy person. Congratulations. You know, thank you, it was a big accomplishment tricking a sane woman with good health insurance to let me get some of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's probably, people are like, are you proud of being a New York Times bestseller? And I'm like, no, you know what I'm really proud of? It's tricking this white lady into <laughs> letting me destroy her credit for the rest of her life. I'm like, that's my real achievement. Like ace in the hole, <laughs> yeah. right? I'm like, the book thing, whatever. Do you know that I have Blue Cross Blue Shields? You know? I'm like, that's, that's a real accomplishment. More and more rare these <laughs> yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She works for a school. She's got that teacher insurance is the best. get that stuff. I mean, I love her, but the insurance. <laughs> It's really, it's why I stay. Major bonus, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, when you like have another person in the house, like I think because I'm a conscientious person, I don't want to like be a terror to live with. So I'm always like, what did I do? And then it's also like, where did she put my thing that I left on the chair? I knew where it was. I know it wasn't put away, but it was like a way to me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes, I do feel, <laughs> feel like I'm being watched Sorry. all the time. That's I mean, that's tricky, I think. <laughs> you know, um, our, our audience demographic might not appreciate all, the, all of the years of research that you've done in television. And, um, <laughs> Is I mean, that what I can we call have it? A, well, sure, <laughs> why okay. not? I mean, it's, right. it's dedicated work. <laughs> yeah. You have an almost encyclopedic knowledge, from what I can tell. But that's not like an impressive thing. You know, if I'm like, I can name every real housewife and their pets, these people aren't gonna, <laughs> these people Some aren't gonna people be like, be whoa, they're but gonna be like, like, go to college, idiot. <laughs> that would be rude. They're gonna think it. <laughs> because you're somewhat of an expert, um, is there a TV show that you think just everyone should watch? Like, Oh man, this is, well, it's tough to, do an everyone thing. Right. I'm not gonna say a reality show, even though I love reality TV. I feel like this is a smarter crowd than that. Um, a lot of book clubs. But also, everyone here can probably afford Showtime. Okay. So, you know, talking to like millennials, they're like, I'm not watching that. But <laughs> Billions, does anyone watch Billions? It's so great. It's like, I mean, that show is a jam. It's got Paul Giamatti, mm -hmm. whom you all loved in Sideways. Of course. And <laughs> thank you for getting that. Right. Somebody Thanks over there laughed real hard. Uh, and who else is in it? Damian Lewis, who was in Homeland. Totally. It's so good. And then Maggie Siff, who I love from Sons of Anarchy, which I'm sure you all are well versed in. They're like, no, dude, we didn't watch that stupid show. But uh, it's so good, it's smart. I have to watch it with the subtitles on uh, or closed captioning on because <laughs> it's all about like finance and lawyers and that ain't really my wheelhouse. So I have to like, I have to read it as I go along. Do you along, like pause is... and look something up sometimes or no? No, I'm not, not that like dedicated. No. Okay. I'm just like you know, credit swaps or whatever, and then I just keep rolling. Um, that is great. And then Atlanta is amazing. Right. Atlanta is so good. That's like, those are my two must watch every week non reality shows. Non reality shows. <laughs> so, okay, we won't. Well, also, I mean, Vanderpump Rules, but I don't think this is that kind of crap. Oh, my people. See, they're here. My they're people. Here. Can you believe that Britney got back with Jax? <laughs> What a nightmare. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a nightmare. After what he put her through. <laughs> Wait, do you watch that show? Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I'm, this, I'm a sucker. I've watched it, though. I have watched a whole episode because I went down the. Um, don't, it like kills your brain cells. It's, I don't know. It's got a powerful homing force, though. It's like you watch and you're just like, I can't stop. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Um, so because you're so honest and vulnerable with your work and so real when you meet your people, does it feel like you have like a vulnerability hangover after six weeks of being on tour? Um, no, I mean, I think when people like come to see, like when like my people who've been like down with me from the beginning come to see me and are like, I mean, I get a lot of tears sometimes. Aww. I once got, in, when I was in New York, I got a, this, I mean, this is amazing. This woman brought her IBS support group. They have a book club <laughs> and like they all came and it was like really intense. Like there were like lots of tears. And then I, of course, made it weird because <laughs> I couldn't handle Ow. like all the earnestness and so, like after they cried at me for like five real minutes, which is a long time, long time. to have someone weep time. on you about her gas or whatever. I, I was like, you guys, what if we all had to go to the bathroom at the same time? <laughs> and then they were like, you're a terrible person. And then they <laughs> left. But it was like afterward, I was like, man, it was really nice that those diarrhea sisters came. Wow. Um, I hope that's what they call their club. <laughs> no, no, oh, I can't okay, remember. Sorry. It had like a serious, Acronym like, or something. yeah, it had like a it's serious. Poop. <laughs> oh People my God. Of, okay, no, we can work on. We'll that. figure it out. I really we'll figure think we should out. come up with some acronyms for that. <laughs> I invite you to join. Yeah. Not on stage, but just in your own minds. <laughs> I don't know. It's. I mean, it's not hard for me to. I mean, really, like, no one like shows up and like yells at me. So, like, it's nice for. I get a lot of hugs, which has been awkward this tour because I had to stop wearing deodorant because I had thrush. Oh. Yeah, boy. I don't even have any kids. I just got it because I'm disgusting. <laughs> and I had it in my armpit, so I had to stop wearing deodorant. So I have toured the country smelling like an ox and like <laughs> having people like, like, I've warned every crowd, they come like, in for the hug and don't get, like, I'm like, don't get in here. It's very <laughs> itchy and it stinks. And they've done it anyway. So like, I, I have, can't promise. I have gotten BO all over a lot of adorable just, young women across <laughs> the country. <laughs> so no, things like that. I mean, it's very validating when someone's like, I don't care how bad you smell. I want to hug you because of what you mean Aww. to me. So I love that. I love it. And then I go home and like, I go to the hotel and just don't talk to anyone for like, until I have to go to another bookstore. So you have enough downtime scheduled. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have done four events in a row this, this week, which is like the most I've ever done at any time. So I don't know. I feel like I'm holding it together. You seem like you're holding Who it knows? together. After this, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but right now, it's totally great. As long it's totally as it's on great. film. As long as someone records it. I, Sorry, I, I can't. Mean, not, we live in this internet age. I can't have my breakdown on Twitter or whatever. It would be terrible. Can we just personal message me a little bit? <laughs> yes. um, I know a lot of writers come to these events. Do you yeah. have any, any pointers that you like to share with other people who are striving to be professional writers or have a well, serious writing practice? Professional is a little loose. Uh, Okay, New York for Times best-selling author. Yeah, but look what I wrote. You know, I wrote a cat book about poop. Come on. Um, I, I don't know. My advice is always... So I feel like the only reason I was successful at this is because I had a job and I didn't have to depend on my writing yeah. to pay because New York Times bestseller doesn't come with a check. It's a very nice thing if you're the kind of person who likes to give people your resume, which I do not. <laughs> um, I cringe, like every time someone reads my bio, I'm like, oh. Uh, <laughs> just stop it, black lesbian. Um, <laughs> Done, <Check>. But <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do what I wanted to do and do this writing that's like what I want if I hadn't worked for so long yeah. um, and I never had to compromise to like get paid. I never had to write like, you know, think pieces or clickbait kind of things because I had a paycheck from the animal hospital so I could just do what I wanted. It took, I mean, I had that job for 14 years. Yeah. It took a long time That's to get a there. Lot of animal 
<laughs> yes, that is a whole lot of uh, getting bitten by other people's dogs. But I never had to like not do what I wanted to do because I didn't have to depend on the writing to pay. And like right now, I have I'm doing writing full time, but I have a job like reviewing books and I write an advice column for Shondaland, and those aren't like my passion projects, but they do keep me paid regularly. But I feel like for people who are writing, I mean... You're basically saying for people who want to write, get a day job. Yeah, work. Go to work (laughs) and write on your lunch break and write on the weekends or whenever you're off. Like this dream that like if you just are passionate enough about the writing and like really throw yourself into it, it'll succeed and like maybe but you'll probably also like be homeless and right. not you're not like, a bunch of white people building a field of dreams in the middle of Iowa yeah I, not, I mean this I, I love the romantic idea of like pursuing your writing passion or like taking years to write your novel so either you need to hook up with somebody who's like I will work so you can write the next great American novel or you got to take your ass to work yeah. and like do it on the side and then like find out that you'll still only make like ten thousand dollars or whatever and like try to live off that until you have to get another soul-sucking job so i'm realistic man you can't be you can't be like sam you keep it real and then expect me to give you like a sweet you can be a writer story you probably can't I (laughs) i don't know how much longer i can be I mean, I don't, I'm not going to do this forever. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. People don't always want what you're selling. Like, I'm like, you know, I got another few years of people wanting to be like, you know, wanting to know what my uterus is doing or whatever. And then I got to tuck it in and start doing something else. So. Practical. Yeah. I I am. I am pragmatic. Stay employed. (laughs) Yeah. That's yes, awesome. keep working. And then if your book thing doesn't fail, you won't feel like, a, or if your book thing fails, you won't feel like a complete failure because you'll be like, at least I have this job. Right. So. Good, good, good advice. I mean, I really Sound wish advice. I was uplifting, but I don't want to, I don't want to mislead set anybody. You people up for a disappointment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Follow I your think dreams. if you're a I New York Times bestselling author, like you'd walk into places and people would be like, oh. New York Times, but it's, no, no, they, they don't. don't do I mean, they're usually like, oh, that person has mustard on a shirt, and she doesn't even know, <laughs> or like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no one ever. I mean, if I go into, into a bookstore, like sometimes they know, but even then, I'm, I'm like, oh, do you think I'm here looking for my own book? Like, it's very embarrassing, so I don't do that. No, no one cares about about this no. I mean like a few people my publisher cares like they're sure. very the they're very care. pleased and like every, here, people here care but in the real world they're like can you play basketball you know what I mean like they're like, are you have you been in a movie like they don't care <laughs> <laughs> like are you on TV oh no get out of here bye, so, <laughs> yeah, bye. they're like get out of my face <laughs> So does that affect your process? Like feeling like, okay, well, I'm going to have to like crank some stuff out before I have to, as you said, tuck it away. Um, I think because, so when you sell a book to a real publisher, you have to give them an outline and they have to like, like what you're going to do. Cause I haven't, we've sold the last couple of books. uh, Well, this one, and then I, I just sold another one. So there'll be Another one in a couple years. I told you I gotta I gotta get years. while the, I gotta get while the getting is. I have to write it. Mm. I have to live some. I thought you meant I sold it like I finished it. Oh so no! Still... See, I was just gonna say like when you get to this level, you can sell a book based on a pitch that you have not <laughs> written yet. So I yeah. So I pitched a whole bunch of things. Some of them are things I planned to do, which you'll see. It'll hopefully it'll be funny. Um, like I wanted to get into like woo woo, uh, crystals and, uh, medicine and stuff. So you're talking to the right person. Oh, great. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about Reiki. Um, but like, (laughs) there's some, among other things, yes. Reiki got the biggest cheer. There's a big Reiki crowd. You're like New York Times bestseller and they're like, and I say Reiki Reiki, and everyone's like, woohoo. You like Um, to crowd dive. (laughs) So I, I sold it. I sold it based on this pitch, and so now I know what I have to, or I know what I said. You know what you I said. I would write, <laughs> which makes things e- which makes things easier. But the thinking up what to write about was 
hard. So we'll see. We'll see. Also, the book I pitched, like the book, this, the cat book is not the book that I pitched. Oh. It, it changed. Like at one point they cut 40,000 words and we're like, give us 40,000 different words. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh. Like I had a heart attack and then my ghost wrote the rest of the book, so. I cannot imagine. Yeah. But at least now I have like a blueprint of what I have to do, which makes things a little easier. You're like, I get that you just gave birth to this baby, but can we have different arms and legs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you can't say no or else they'll sue you and I can't afford to get sued. So I've said, of course, and <laughs> wrote some new so legs. So those contracts are even more intense than a marriage license then. I mean, I don't read mine. That's what I have an agent for, but yes. <laughs> Why would I read that stuff? <laughs> Everyone here is like, get this joke person off the stage. No. She doesn't even read her contracts. I know. I, I think we, I don't know, <laughs> did we have contracts for tonight? I'm not sure. I, I just signed something in the lobby. We'll see. Maybe they get a kidney after we're done with this. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I was like, X where? <laughs> you wake up in a, in, a, in a bathtub full of ice. Yeah. Is that the thing? Be like, oh, this is what I gave away? National okay. Writer Series seems so innocuous. <laughs> Do you have any like rituals around writing? Like, do you have a special like si sitting area or? My desk is shoved into the corner of the <laughs> living room, um, and my writing ritual is typically to wait until two days before the deadline, <laughs> and then cry and write and cry more, and then turn it in and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any. I don't know any writers who write things like before their before due. deadlines. None. Yeah. And I know a lot of writers. Yeah. I'm like nobody. Nobody does, does their things in advance. Yeah. I'm to this time. I'm trying to change. But my first deadline for the new book is June 1st, and I'm supposed to have, I'm supposed to have five essays, 2,500 to 5,000 words each, and I have written. <laughs> You're such a rebel. They're not so, listening. They're not listening. Yeah, they so know. like May 25th, <laughs> I'll be crying and writing Fine. and crying. So you don't enjoy the, like when you have an idea for something, do you know where you're going or do you just like get it all out and then edit? Usually I, if I know what I want to write about, I know how it's going to end and I write the ending first. Got it. Uh, and then I go back and figure out how to get, how to there, get there, how to get there. So usually I don't write and I don't start anything that I don't know how I'm gonna finish, which makes the process a little bit easier. Like if you know what note you're gonna end on, I mean, you can start anywhere, but you know that you have to get to this place. And so sometimes I can do it in 2,000 words or sometimes in 5,000 words, it depends on what it is, but I always know how it's gonna end. Have you ever thought of writing a, an advice column for people with pets since you worked with pets so much? I mean, maybe, so I have this advice column now. If you want to send me a pet question, I will answer it. I mean, I'm basically an armchair veterinarian. I ran that hospital for 14 years. I know <laughs> a no lot. Joke. I know a lot of cat stuff if you have cat questions. So, if, I mean, but you you yourself survived having and I don't mean to make anyone uncomfortable here for the cat people among the audience, but you yourself survived having pretty much the world's most evil cat. Yeah, she was terrible. She was terrible. I mean, and her I had her was like I had her when I worked at the hospital and you know, I couldn't like sneak and give her away because they would all they would all know. They would know if I was like, Oh look, this random cat came in to be euthanized. So I've suffered with her. <laughs> I don't know, someone just dropped it off with a sign that said, Kill me. So so I, <laughs> that was a contract that I definitely didn't read before yeah. I you may got not that cat. <laughs> before I got that cat. I mean, she was great. We we had a. I mean, I don't want to get to woman with a cat in here, but we had a. We learned to like you know, we we're like two cars on the same road, but we never crossed in each other's lanes. She knew exactly which sweaters of yours to barf on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she would. She wouldn't barf. She was like a biting, attacking cat. It wasn't barf. Would have been welcome. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'd have been like, oh, you puked in my shoes? Great. That's so but much she better. once bit me on the eye while I was asleep. I, yes. What? I was terrorized for like 10 years. And, you, and yet you've made it through to get more cats in your life. Yeah, well, it's like the prerequisite. You marry a woman and they just give you three you cats, cats at the, you get at the a toast courthouse. Oven and three cats. Like, yeah, here you go. Yeah, they're like, here's a crock pot and three kittens. Mm. Look, what, look what we had behind the counter. Oh. So, yeah, now we have three, can, now three you've got cats. Now your lesbian lifestyle all set <laughs> yeah. in a package. Yeah. We just need like a riding mower or something and three make, it, make it complete. Yeah, what does a lesbian household need? Like exquisite linens. Yeah. Nice scented candles. Yes. Check, check. What else? Like three kittens, a toaster mm -hmm. oven. A Carhartt jacket. Carhartt jacket. <laughs> a multi-tool, like a leather man or another kind yeah. of multi-tool. I don't even know if we have that. I'm not the tool person. Okay. Well, we can I mean, I have that. some tools, but we can't Ayo. talk about those. <laughs> yeah. It's not appropriate. I have a multi-tool. I think there's a lot of people who would like to hear about that. Silicone. <laughs> Multi-speed. It can't cut anything. <laughs> so I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Please. It's amazing. I'm sorry. So I'm not even I drunk. Say. I just am like this. I just am like this. It's so good. God. So if you were to start this animal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going back to that? Okay. Okay, no, good. That's it. Okay, my animal advice column, yes. Yeah, I mean, would it be an offshoot of Bitches Gotta Eat, or would it be, um, which is Samantha's existing blog, in case you hadn't taken note yet, you should visit it yeah. right after you buy her books. <laughs> Don't be a cheap jerk and just read the free stuff online. Buy the book. I'm it's gonna, really good. I'm going to get t-shirts that say that. Don't yeah. be a cheap jerk. Don't be a cheap jerk. Um, oh, man. I don't know. I feel like I would, I would try to get, like, Cat Fancy or something to let me do it totally. on, on their thing. I was just picturing you in one of the, like, kitten poses from a calendar being like, hang in there, pal. You want to be my manager? We can I'm make in, this yes. happen. I we just can, got a job. We can make this I'm so excited. Happen. I think it would be great, personally, obviously. I have a bias about that. But I have an evil cat that I don't know what to do with. So, you know, we can talk about that more later. OK. Um, you had said at one point, after you're finished writing something, you just feel like it's complete garbage. Yes. Like, is that everything? Yes. And, and <laughs> so how do you deal with the reality that, like, People are buying this thing that I believe is valuable and they believe is valuable and you're just like, oh. Thank you, oh, that is very nice, thank you. Um, I don't think like it's like garbage for you to read it. I just, I never turn off the like, this could be better, this could be funnier. Mm -hmm. Why is that sentence so long? Why is, and so like redoing or reissuing Meaty, I was like, when they said they were gonna like buy it and put it out again, I was like, oh great. I can go through and fix everything that was terrible. I can make like all those jokes better. And they were like, actually, you can write new stuff to introduce each section of the book, but you can't fix any of the old things because it'll, we don't wanna mess with the tone. And I was like, but if the tone is terrible, <laughs> Which it's not. It's not. But it's I was like, not. I was like, just let me like. But it's your internal up editor the that yeah. just really wants to like yeah. improve things. Yeah. So they fixed all the like they dotted the I's and crossed the T's and all the like copy editing stuff, but they didn't let me change any of the jokes. So it's it's not that I don't want people to read it because I think it's bad. I just I read it and I think, oh God, this could be better. Or like, why didn't I catch this? before or this could be funnier well that must mean you're getting you know better at your craft if you feel like oh i could have done that better yeah or like spiraling deeper into <laughs> mental illness one, <laughs> one or the other. potato potato well and i think that that's i mean it's an interesting arena to consider that many famous authors throughout time have struggled with mental illness yeah. and various health issues and I love that you guys think that's funny. 
let me go get my friend Vinny Van Gogh out here. He's going to crack you up. But I think, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thing to just talk about that vulnerability and, and dealing with the world that way. It makes me wonder if that's, you know, if the editor is kind of what drives the show for you. I think, I mean, I think when writing something, it's just the, like, getting it out mm -hmm. and then being like, okay, this is funny. The world can see this. And then, like, with my blog, I could just put it out and I never had to look at it again. <laughs> But with these books, like you have to keep reading it to people. Um, and like, and then in my mind, there's the constant. So I'm ordinarily not like a finicky person. I do everything sloppily. I mean, well, well I'll have you over and you can. Your you house can, looks really nice on Instagram. Yeah, because you don't <laughs> see my desk, which is piled with mountains of things. I like to write, I basically just push my laptop into the crap and hope that none of it topples over onto the keys, and then that's how I write, and then I slowly pull it out to like <laughs> go work on, another sur work on another surface. So like it's not in my personality to be really finicky, but it's, I mean, it's like if you had to read your high school diary mm. over and over and over to groups of people. Like if you take it home and read it, no problem. Right. But if I have to like look at you while reading it, I'm like, oh, this, no. Hurts. Yeah. That kind of yeah. hurts. Yeah. Well, which brings me to the On that note, I'm going to read my diary moment. to you. Yeah. Would you like to read your... Yeah, the, I'm going to read a I little we something. we have a selection tonight from We Are Never Meeting in Real Life. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to read... This was requested by Anne. Um, there is a... All of my things are too long to read uh, in total because <laughs> you would be here for like half an hour listening to me droning on. So this is from a chapter whose title I cannot say, but you'll figure it out if you get the book. And uh, it's about this period of time when I was obsessed with Zumba, <laughs> which if you don't know is the exercise dance craze that overtook the nation a couple of years ago. Okay. Ditch the workout and join the party, the official website shouted at my eyeballs. Zumba, and I quote, is the only Latin-inspired dance fitness program that blends red-hot international music and contagious steps to form a fitness party that is downright addictive. I am suspicious of words like addictive and contagious. And I immediately blanched while clicking through all the pictures of lean and toned soccer moms gyrating in crop tops and neon bicycle shorts, their perfect bodies beaded with sweat, their toothy, open mouth grins screaming, I am having the time of my young and conventionally attractive life. <laughs> I am a negative person by nature. <laughs> And I typically shy away from anything that requires me to be having visible fun. I like to do stuff that I can sit quietly in the back and enjoy. And I've spent my entire adult life perfecting a bored yet slightly amused and entertained facade. And I just don't understand being excited about exercise. It's like doing a cartwheel on your way to have a root canal. <laughs> My face just doesn't light up at the prospect of abdominal isolations. <laughs> also, the pictures. Look at that instructor guy with his shirt off. I'm not trying to embarrass myself tripping over my feet, doing watered down salsa steps, while some red hot international instructor rolls his eyes at me in disgust and bounces quarters off his ridiculously chiseled backside. <laughs> The Sunday morning of my first class, I got up and put on socks and my old New Balances while remaining in my pajamas. <laughs> I can't compete with these jerks doing a revolutionary new fitness concept while wearing bikini tops, so I decided it was in the best interest of my self-esteem to go, to go to the opposite end of the clothing spectrum and just look like absolute trash. <laughs> because even if I busted my melon open while trying to cumbia to the beat, at least my jibs would be appropriately covered. I took 37 a leave and a Norco. <laughs> That's real. 
<laughs> and tried to inconspicuously stretch my Achilles on the train platform so it wouldn't snap in the middle of a routine. When I got to the gym, I paid the $15 drop-in fee and found my way up to the dance studio. I hovered nervously near the back of the gym, anxious for all the J-Lo look-alikes to start pouring in and making me feel bad about that container of Greek yogurt I'd eaten in the locker room. <laughs> and then your mom came in, wearing booty shorts and the shirt she wears to wash the dishes, flanked on either side by your Aunt Judy and your recently retired fifth grade teacher. <laughs> Her sewing circle showed up next, as did her crochet buddies and all the ladies from book club, <laughs> with the exception of Kathy, whose son had strep, so she decided to stay home with him. There's the woman who cuts your mom's hair, and Diane, who works part-time at Eileen Fisher in the mall. The school board ladies, the PTA, and the hockey moms came running in too, clad in biker shorts and racerback tanks with their hair pulled up in banana clips and scrunchies. I don't know what I'd been so worried about. <laughs> I thought this was for attractive young people, I wondered aloud to no one in particular. <laughs> A lady down the way looked me up and down. Yeah, she said, eyeing my flabby triceps and pulling a protein bar from her fanny pack. Me too. <laughs> the music started and our teacher, a boisterous woman who was wearing a sports bra and a noisy coin skirt, whose constant jangling set my molars on fire, started shouting and dancing and pointing out people who sucked as we tried desperately to follow along. I was winded after the first song, and 20 minutes in, I told the woman struggling next to me to call me an ambulance. <laughs> I was sweating in the grossest possible way, sweat dripping from my hair into my eyelashes before rolling down my nose. Your mom is pretty good at Zumba, but thank goodness she ain't got no rhythm. The only thing that kept me from looking like a complete moron was my blackness, which kicked in right when I needed it most. I might not have gotten every single step, but at least I wasn't clapping on the one and the three. <laughs> Despite the, oh, I love that, you like that. I love that. Despite the fact that I really did almost keel over and die, I was hooked. It is physically impossible for me to smile while skipping and jumping and fist pumping, but I loved it. Thumping loud music at 9.30 on a Sunday morning in a room full of wasps who are coming down off a Chardonnay bender. More please. These ladies yelled and whooped and screamed for an hour. Then they toweled off and hopped in their, Lex their Lexus SUVs to congregate over skinny lattes at the Starbucks two streets over. The minute that first class was finished, I vomited my right lung onto the locker room floor then went downstairs and signed over half my paycheck to become an official member of the gym. It was fun. My heart rate was high enough to make me feel like an actual sentient human being. And, for your information, Ricky Martin made a lot of good dance music. So bite your hateful tongue. And it's lame knowing that I need the withering gaze of your hot-flashed perimenopausal mother to get me to samba my way to maybe living past the age of 39. But admitting defeat is the first step, right? I live in fear of the day I go flying off a moving treadmill, but pretending I can bachata to Gloria Estefan for an hour is something I can do. Plus, your mom said she would bake me gluten-free cookies and give me the number to her masseuse next week. And that girl has a tight ass. I've been noticing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I almost I choked on that ice. Don't do it. I almost spit took. <laughs> spit took? Yeah, well, that, that works. The, OK, you're yeah. the expert. Um, just one more thing. I was wondering, you know, being Whoa, women of size, right? <laughs> yeah, so I did this reading in Chicago and we did the Q&A, which is, 
excruciating, but also great. Uh, this girl stood we'll up. We'll do it here in a minute. <laughs> this girl, yeah, so don't do what I'm about to say. This girl stood up, and she was like, I wanted to ask you for some dating advice, which, come on. What do I know? So I was like, sure, okay. And then she was like, as a woman of size, did you ever have trouble dating? And I was like, first of all, woman of size is like, I mean, of all the euphemisms. <laughs> I'd rather be like, you know, so a person with rhinoceros sized ankles. <laughs> how, how was it trying to get people to buy you dinner? But, uh, yeah, so. And, how, so and was this I, person a woman of size? No, That's she okay. was very small. Oh, okay, neat. So then I put a hex on her so she'll never yeah. have another date ever again. She weighs 300 pounds now. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, first of all, I and had she's... no problem. And second of all, your metabolism's going to stop tomorrow. <laughs> so I'll check in with her in a couple of years. And she can tell me how it is trying to yeah. date as a woman of size. Can oh, you believe God. that? Ugh. What do you say, I mean, I, since this part of your mind that's kind of constantly trying to improve things is, <laughs> that is a nice very way to put it. active, mm -hmm. how do you deal with body image stuff? I mean, we live in this culture that's kind of rough on us. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like if body negativity was a movement, I'd be in that, but it isn't. <laughs> right, I, mostly, I mostly just like hate being alive, so. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, there is so, a like, list in this book of all the things you hate about yourself, about your physical yeah, form, and that's I bold. Mean, I mean, it's you're like, yep, every like. Oh yeah, I, I make a list of all of my physical flaws. Every one. There's a lot of them. There's probably more now because I'm a few years older. That'll be in the next I book. <laughs> Everything's hanging a couple inches lower. Um, I, I mean, I, I think because like I'm creeping up on 40, right? And I feel like at this age, I, you can opt out of like looking good and like okay. trying to keep it together, you know? But you look good. Girl, so well, thank you. Thank you. Stop it. You guys don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. But right. you know what you know what I I'm mean though. Like I feel like the the general standards of beauty, right? That you sure. have to be like the beauty myth. Yeah, that you have to we? be like thin and toned and all that. I feel like there's like an age limit to that. I mean, <laughs> physically, you just can't, right? And like you're not in charge of your hormones right? anymore. I just I had an almost hysterectomy. I had to have the surgery on my uterus. And like you you start to realize that your hormones are in charge of everything. You can't do anything. You're powerful powerless against your body. And so I feel like thinness and looking good is like a young person's game anyway. So now I'm at the point where like I can admire someone. And I love when people are like, I love myself. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wear shorts even though like right. I'm a chubby girl. Like I love all of that and I want everyone to do what they want. I prefer to wear a sack and like, <laughs> Hi, a fashionable hide. caftan. Yes, yeah. I'm just at the age, like, you guys, I'm not even wearing, like, a real bra today. I can, I usually, I don't do, like, I didn't even lift them up. They're just sort of, like, held in place. They're just smushed, smushed like, down. And I feel them. like when you get to this age, man, like, my reward for having survived this long <laughs> is, like, hating the package, but also not changing the wrapping. So I just am, like... I, you know, I just want to like sit down and watch TV and never wake up. So I don't worry about. <laughs> I don't worry about. Oh God, come on, it's okay. You go last. That was they a joke. care. They the, care. They're like, oh it's, please, they know don't. They really want you to feel okay. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> but I, you know, I like hate my body, but I don't want to do anything about it. You know? That's a kind of acceptance. I don't want to do anything. You know what I mean? Like, there's got to be people in here who are like. Like, I'll walk around, but like, I'll do Zumba or whatever, but like, come on. It's a not lot like of, every day. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah. I'm not having any kids. It's fine. It's just, I'll keep it going as long as it's going to go and then check out. Excellent. <laughs> Well, All we, these hopeless answers. I, I'm sorry. No, we're hoping it, we're, we'll keep you for whoever, a long time. Whoever is here next week is going to be like really uplifting and great. <laughs>
You're way cuter. <laughs> They're going to be like, that woman last week <laughs> had me checking my life insurance policy. Well, yeah, you got to make sure. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think we're going to have some time to take a couple questions from yeah. the audience because that's your favorite part, right? No, no, I do love it. Just don't <laughs> say woman of size. Yeah. Just use, use oh, your it's common so weird. sense and courtesy. Oh, it's nice when the lights come up. You can yeah, like see all these people. everybody. Hi, everybody. I was just staring into lights before, but now, look, you guys are all so cute. Yeah. I oh, and up there, I love that. Yeah, look at it. Hey, so, hi, I think everybody. Some people have some questions. Yeah, for please you. ask me anything, whatever you want. I mean, I'll just like okay. if no one asks questions, then this part is very uncomfortable for <laughs> everyone involved. Okay. Then we'll just start talking about '90s music. Well, and then they'll all get up and file right. out. Right. We'll just sit here. Yeah. Hey, how's Hi. it going? Great, how are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm an inspiring writer too. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree with you. The process is awful sometimes. Yeah. But I'm curious about your pitch. What does that look like? Because uh, to really make a moving pitch requires a couple things, like a nut graph and all these other crazy terms. What is that? Teach me. Yeah, so a nut graph is like the thesis of a pitch. And they tell you it has to be convincing and moving and all this stuff. but. <sighs> I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know that mine was moving. Maybe it was bowel moving. But <laughs> my pitch, so, I, so because I do essays, mine was a letter. So I had to write a letter to my current editors and be like, hey, it was great doing a book with you. And I, I mean, I just wanted to write New York Times bestseller over and over and just turn <laughs> that in and be like, give me half a million dollars, but it didn't work like that. So I had to like write a letter and I was like, I mean, this is, so I was like, basically I'm gonna do another thing that's more of the same, but meaner and <laughs> older. And then, so there was like a letter part and I was like, thanks for working with me. It was great working with you guys. And then the pitch, is I pitched like 19 or 20 new essays. Um, so some things have changed in my life. Like I got married and I'm doing this now and I have some other creative things. And I also, I started writing about being anxious and depressed and I felt like uh, I need to write about what the next piece in that journey is like. So I pitched some things about working on my mental health, which I have not started to do, as you can tell, <laughs> if you paid attention to this whole thing, which is basically me laying out my anxiety and depression for all of you. Um, we love it. So I just, I wrote like a paragraph about what each essay would be, and then I sent it. I sent it to my agent, who then like fixed it and made it sound professional, and then he sent it to them, and it was easy. But the first time I pitched, I wrote I did the same thing, and then I wrote four essays so they could see what they were getting. Um, but this time, because, I mean, they already know it's just going to be a bunch of curse words with uh, bodily functions in between. I didn't have to do that. I just wrote, like, a detailed outline. And we'll see. I think it'll be, I think it'll be good. I'm workshopping the title at every tour stop, so I'll let you guys weigh in. So the first title I was thinking was Blood Bag. Okay, all right. Okay. And then the, my second title is Dying is Fine. Oh. That, okay, that was the one I was gonna go, I, that's the one I was gonna go with. But so, I kind of want you to make a zine called Blood Bag. Or I would, I would. Be so I'll cool. do it. I mean, but a zine, doesn't that sound like a lot of work? Yeah, not much money. Ugh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Done. All I'll right. do one issue. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Someone over here? Or, oh, excuse me. Oh, there are people with mics? This is very professional. Will you tell us about your tattoos? Oh, girl, my tattoos. So I do not believe in getting meaningful tattoos. <laughs> I just don't. Also, I started getting tattooed in the late 90s, so like tribal tattoos were a thing, so I have some. People are always like, eh, that's not cool, and I'm like, eh, I came of age in the 90s, what can I do, right? <laughs> so I'll tell you some interesting, so I have an Ursula tattoo mm -hmm. on my hand, uh, Ursula from uh, 
<laughs> Little Mermaid. Uh, let's see, I have some knuckle tattoos that say born dead, which is very inspirational. <laughs> but uplifting, a ray of sunshine. Uh, this one is very interesting. I uh, got a, <laughs> Laura's laughing. I got, that's my friend Laura over there, without whom I would not uh, have written these books. But I got a boyfriend's initial, and when I got it, she was like, you're stupid. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, no, man, even if we break up, which we totally won't, even if we break up, it'll be like, I'll have like the memory. I'm not going to care. And this is a cover up of that, <laughs> of that tattoo. And then I have a bunch of like grim reapers and like death skulls. And there's a reaper with a smoking pistol. Oh, this one. Okay. So this one here, um, do you got, <laughs> do the lesbians in the house? Anyone other than the lesbians in the house know of Ani DeFranco? <laughs> so I was very into her, and she has yes. like a breastplate tattoo that's similar to this, so I got that. And then over here, I got, uh, I want no one else to succeed, which <laughs> is a quote from There Will Be Blood. Have you guys seen that movie? It's incredible. <laughs> So like I'm like the idiot who like watches a movie and I'm like that horrible thing you said I'm gonna get that tattooed. I don't like to put a lot of thought into the tattoos. I just go in and do it. I have a I have a tattoo on my neck that's a Chinese symbol that doesn't mean what I was told it meant. Oh, no. And I feel like once that happens to you, you just I just get whatever garbage. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like after that happens, it's just like, whatever. What, I, none on the face, I won't do the face because that's painful and also I can't, but I will get any dump. Do you want to get matching tattoos after this? You want to? Let's do this. We'll talk after, we'll talk. We'll get like tramp stamps or something. Okay, we've got someone oh, up on the balcony. Hi. Hi. Um, I am curious what other writers, what writers inspire you, either contemporary writers or historical, um, or what particular pieces, if any, you look up to, try to emulate, or that have been formative to your style of writing? So I started writing my blog a million years ago, and it was just like stream of consciousness that I would like shape into a story. And I, don't, I definitely was not reading any essays back then. And I don't know that I emulate as much, I don't know that I emulate anyone's style as much as I still have like a stream of consciousness kind of style that then I try to shape into a story. But there are lots of writers that I love and look up to. I mean, Lindy West is like one of the best doing it like we do like a similar thing and she's so great. I'm infinitely jealous of her work. Um, I've been telling everyone I know to read Hanif Abdurraqib's book, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us. It's incredible, it's so good. You should all read that. Um, I don't, who else is essays? You know what book of essays was amazing? Sachi Cole. Uh, it's got a super long, it's called, it's got a super long title that's shortened to One Day We'll All Be Dead, which is definitely in my lane. Mm -hmm. And it is also, <laughs> it is also really fantastic. So those are three like people who do what I do, who I am also like incredibly intimidated when I read their work and I'm like, hmm, I should quit this. So <laughs> those are, those are my three. So I don't know if you've started moving towards your other project of making Meaty into a sh television show. Yeah. But what is your role or what will be your role in like the process? Cause okay. Is it, aren't you working with other comedians like Abby Jacobson? And yeah. Such? Sounds like you know a little bit about <laughs> what I'm doing. So uh, for the last like two and a half, almost, no, it's been three years. Um, so Abby Jacobson of Broad City, I'll tell the shortened version of the story. 
Abby Jacobson of, okay. I did a show with Janine Garofalo Woo! right after the book came out. And I, went, I, I did a piece about Fifty Shades of Grey and she loved it. And uh, I went up to her after the show and I was like, I love you, I've always loved you. Here are, t here's two copies of my books, and, or of my book. And I just gave it to her and she was like, I don't do social media, so you'll never know if I like it. And I was like, cool, fine. Um, and then a few months later, she did Broad City and she loved the book so much that she gave copies to Abby and Alana. And Abby emailed me and I did not watch Broad City. So I thought it was just a fan letter. It was just like, hey, if you're ever, if you're ever in New York, I would love to take you to coffee to pitch you an idea. And like eight months later, I wrote back and was like, LOL, I guess. So <laughs> it took like a year for us to go back and forth. She finally, if she would have opened up being like, I'm a famous person with a TV show, I would have responded. <laughs> right away, but I don't go to New York all the time. So anyway, so Abby came to Chicago and we met, and she was like, let's make this into a show. And I said, as long as I don't have to be on it, I'm down. And so she hired Jesse Klein, who produced Amy Schumer's show and wrote for SNL. And Jesse and I worked, FX optioned it, and we worked for a couple years um, writing the pilot. And we wrote, I think, a pretty good pilot. Um, but FX didn't love it, and Jesse and I were tired of working on it, so we parted ways with FX. So that's like kind of sad, but we pitched it again at some new places, and we just got a contract. It's not signed yet, so I can't say anything, but we're going to redevelop it with another network that you could probably guess if you think really hard Yay! and have basic cable. <laughs> it's lifetime. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It is not lifetime, but look for an announcement. I have a conference call next week. Look for an announcement soon. We're redeveloping it and we're going to write it a little differently. And so hopefully, cross your fingers, they'll let me put it on. TV, it's, it's black and it's queer and there's a lot of poop in it. And <laughs> I really wanna make, I really wanna make a show, in all seriousness, I really would like to make a show about what it is like to have either like a silent disease or the kind of thing that people don't readily mm -hmm. see, like a silent illness. Like people have a lot of stuff going on and you never know and I feel like we don't get to see that on TV like unless it's tragic. Um, and I just want to make a show about somebody living with an illness and like, you know, coping with it and what that's like, what it's like when you can't afford your meds, what it's, what it's like when you have to go to work and you're sick, but no one can see really what's wrong with you. So hmm. hopefully, so obviously it's going to be revolutionary. Uh, <laughs> obviously. Um, but yeah, cross your fingers. It's going to, we're going to try to get that on your TV in the next couple of years. So, and yeah. so you asked, I told you all that and didn't even really answer your question. So I am executive producing, which sounds fancy, but is not, and uh, writing, so I'm gonna write it. And I have another, this isn't official either, but I'm gonna go to LA, I think, in the next couple of weeks and work on a new show that's coming out that you'll hear about soon. I hate to be like, I can't tell you, but it's cool, but it's cool. I just can't tell you. So soon, soon, y'all hear about something, uh, hopefully. Okay, we have another question up here. Yeah. Um, so you've talked in your books about a lot of experiences that you've had that have been hard. Yeah. Um, you've seen a lot of sh Yeah. And a lot of death, especially. Yeah. So what kind of would be your advice, because you stayed so positive, maybe not all the time, but you have a very comedic, positive presence and mm -hmm. you've been able to uphold that. What kind of advice would you give to people who struggle in crisis or have struggled with loss? So for those of you who don't know, both of my parents died when I was 18 separately. Um, and I think my way of dealing with it is that at least for me, if you give a thing enough time you can like find the humor in it 
or maybe, you know, not like a knee slapping. Like, okay, so when my mom died, um, the, we had her funeral at this church that my sister was going to. None of us is really religious, but my sister was like putting up a front. Like, I think she was going to church to catch men. But um, we had it at this, we had the funeral at this church and the minister kept calling my dead mother by our, my sister's name. And it was hilarious. I was like <laughs> crying laughing <laughs> because it was so awkward and like terrible. I like my mom's laying there and he kept calling her Carmen and every time I just would like fall apart <laughs> laughing. And then by the end of it, like everyone was laughing and we were just like, can we wrap this up? Because this is ridiculous. So I feel like, you know, it's not gonna always be something like that, but I feel like if you look hard enough, or sometimes not even that hard, but for me, like looking hard enough to find like the absurd thing about it um, always helps, or it always has helped me. Um, also, time, I mean, I know that old saying, like time heals all wounds, but really, if if you just, like a year from when it happens, you're gonna be like, man, I can't even believe, you know, I, maybe not so much with death, but like I've had, I've lost friendships and all sorts of things have happened, relationships. And you just like give it some time and you're like, man, remember when I was totally miserable? I don't really, because time has sort of put some distance between me and those feelings. So also it doesn't hurt to like just unload it onto your, people. I mean, that's what they're there for. I use my people very liberally. I'm like, you know, you want to process that thing with me for another 22 hours? And then, like, they have to because they're your friends. And over the course of that, like, you will find the funny thing and you'll find the thing that helps you get through it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, you better make it great. It's a lot of pressure. That'll be me. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, what you're saying about the uh, um, people with silent diseases, Yeah, that would be great to put on TV, mm -hmm. you know, because people, they can't really make jokes about your disease. Right. People mm -hmm. make jokes about um, people having seizures all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have epilepsy. And it's kind of like, I don't, I mean, I'm very lucky because, you know, medication is a great thing. Mm -hmm. but oh, I love medicine. <laughs> let's get together. I have a lot of medicine in my We can make right it now. rain, me and you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We can make a whole thing happen. Yeah. My backpack sounds like a maraca every time. <laughs> baby. I set it down. Going through TSA. Uh, it's a lot when you have like a silent thing. But like I, again, it's like, you know, if someone saw you with a cane, they probably wouldn't say anything to you, but people make light of things all the time. And I feel like the more we sort of say, you know, shut up, you don't know what's happening. Or here's a little education. I mean, putting it on TV, you know, you gotta sprinkle a little sugar on it so that it goes down easy. And I'm pretty good at that, at being mm -hmm. like, here's a horrible thing, but it's also kind of funny. So it, I mean, once I got this opportunity, I also, I mean, you know, as a black, uh, I feel a huge responsibility to like do something with this opportunity because we don't get a lot. I really had to struggle to keep this one. So I feel like as many things as I can knock out as possible. Also like a big piece of it for me, like, you know, speaking about being black, it's just like, you know, we don't, we don't hear a lot of, like we get a lot of like, um, either like extraordinary black pain or like the other end of the spectrum, which is like extraordinary black wealth. Like there's shows like Blackish where there's a doctor and uh, what does he do? An advertising guy, like they're super rich. And I would like to, I feel like there are a lot of us in the middle, black, white, brown, everything else. I feel like there are a lot of us in the middle who are going through things and have regular things happening that we just don't get to see. So if I could put some of that on TV, 
and like bring some understanding and some representation. I know that's a big buzzword right now, but it's true. <laughs> if I could get some representation out there, it'll be a good thing. So say whatever prayers y'all got to say <laughs> so that this works out and I can do this. Are we done? We've got one more and then we're done. One, okay, one more. Samantha, welcome to Traverse City from Thank Michigan you. Writers. I know you live Thank in Kalamazoo you. now, so yeah. you're in the state. Yeah. My, my question for you, you kind of built on it. I was, you mentioned a couple questions ago about this moment in time that you find yourself in. So the way you answered the last question about taking advantage of the times we're in. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, writing the books, being on the road, what have you learned about what we in the US tolerate when it comes to women's humor? Or, or what women are allowed in terms of what's funny, what's not, the C word, all of those kinds of things. Well, I do use the C word, I think at least once. I know it's in meaty. Um, I, I have always been a person who has just sort of said whatever, and whatever consequences, I, I mean, I, I just haven't had many at least not in, like, I don't like, you know, scroll through Twitter, like, looking to see what people say about my work, because Twitter's a toilet, and I don't hate myself <laughs> enough to do that. But, so, I don't know, I have been lucky that, like, my work has been, at least as far as I know, well received. Um, I do think that, I don't know, I think it's a good time to be a woman in comedy. I mean, all these dudes keep like jerking off in plants and <laughs> touching people's butts. I'm like, the, <laughs> one of the times we were at FX was the day the Louis C.K. news broke. And I was like, do we even have to bring notes to this meeting? We're three women, give us the show. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know, I mean like everything's terrible still and like, you know, we're, I mean women still have it hard, but I'm trying to take advantage of the fact that, you know, some of these dudes are on the way out. Um, <laughs> and like see if I can get my foot in the door before they, <laughs> before they come back. <laughs> they always come back, so. So like while Louie's like, you know, doing underground comedy clubs in New York, if I could reach in and snatch some Viacom money and make my little show, that would be, that would be great. But I feel like there has been a good response, at least to me. I know a lot of women who are working in comedy and doing really well. Still not as good as some of the dudes do, but you know, that's, it's all in time. We just have to murder them all and then it won't be a problem <laughs> whatsoever. I'm in. So basically, that's my career plan, is to <laughs> kill all dudes and then make my little show. And then, you know, new ones will be born, and by the time they're ready to take it back over, I'll be you know, on an island somewhere. <laughs> is that a good note to end on? I the love it. On an island somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>